<sighs> What's today? I, you know, I had to take a look at the clock and everything else, and I was like, whoa, a Thursday? Yeah. You know, today <laughs> must be special for us to be here on a Thursday. You know, I get dressed once a week. <laughs> <laughs> That's Don't believe what you hear. Don't believe all the hype. It's, no, that is, that is definitely fake news. <laughs> How are you, Jolyn? I'm good. How are you doing? I was just you about know? to pin the cousin something. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to let you do your thing while I'm just saying, you know, hey, I'm I'm feeling blessed. I'm, yeah. I'm enjoying today. The sunshine while we still got it here in the Northwest. I was shocked, Mark. I mean, it's Thursday and I was so shocked that we had um some sun today. I mean, it's still kind of cold outside, but you know. I mean, yeah, it's 69 degrees. It's been it's been pretty warm throughout this entire time, but you know, Seattle for the mo or Washington State for the most part has been pretty sunny. I mean, don't believe what here's a thing. Here's a common thing that I hear a lot. Does it rain a lot in Seattle? Like, and I let's just knock out some myths here. First things first, it does rain. But it doesn't rain just like it's monsoon season, like you're in Virginia or like, you know, in other arenas. You know, it's, yeah, it's, it's nice and precipitous. You know what, Mark? New York gets more rain. Thank um, you. Here than Seattle does. And it's I was going to say that. You know, downpours. <laughs> so. It's a concrete jungle and you got a lot of rain. So, <laughs> well, today we got a special show for everybody. Yes. Because back by popular demand, we are bringing back the man, the myth, the legend himself, the the oil and gas cousin, yes. uh, cousin John Roland from Bar Chart. By the way, shout out to our friends over there at Bar Chart because, you know, again, you know the story, you know the vibes. My journey began and then it's like the torch got passed on to Jolyn. And then now it's like we're passing it on to each and every single one of you. So thank you. All right, so let's get some of the obvious stuff out of the way, shall we? Like, for example, if you haven't subscribed yet, you know, come on. <laughs> We're here on a Thursday, y'all. We're here on a Thursday. <laughs> um, yeah, just go ahead and hit that subscribe button down below. We would greatly appreciate it. And on top of that, if you want to be in the know, just like our cousin, Damien. Damien. He said, is it Let's Damon? get it. Well, it says, Damien or Damien. Yo, Spell your name. Please feel free to give us the phonetic spelling yeah. in the chat. <laughs> and so for those that don't know what phonetic spelling is, it's just pretty much as you sound out the word. That's pretty much how you spell it. Um, but yeah, so if you want to be like our brother here, then go ahead and hit the bell so that way you can be a part of the notification squad, a.k.a. the Cool Kids Club. And on top of that, if you like the content and what we do, and if you wanted to get out to other people around the world, go ahead and hit that like button. We would greatly appreciate it. But Jolyn, yes. moving forward, yes. what's going on in the market today? What happened? Totally. What does it because <laughs> Jolyn GC in the place to be? Let's get into this market on a Thursday or whatever. We have the Dow, um, negative 107.10 points. We are now at a level of 30,000, six, or excuse me, 30,076.68. We also have the S&P um, 500 coming in at negative 31.94. We are now occupying levels of 3,757.99. Looking at the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ was negative 153.59 points. We are now getting kind of kind of real cozy in this 11,000 low. We're at 11,066.81. And the VIX came down a little bit uh, to 27.35. And the 10-year Treasury note is up 3.713 percentage points. Heading over to sector performance, as you know, there are 11 sectors and we like to track the top three and the bottom three so we can see what that rotation is looking like on a Thursday. We got health, communication services and consumer staples holding it down in the top three. I will note that consumer staples, even though it was um, in the top three, it was negative today. And for our bottom three, we have industrials, financials and consumer discretionary. Now, 
If you are new to the channel, you can find our pick list, aka the sip list, um, over there on our Instagram page at that come up series. We have SQQQ holding it down at 3.67 percentage points to the upside, um, followed by ABBB with 1.92 percentage points. And we have UNH, uh, 1.05 mm. percentage points to the upside. Our bottom three, Z Scalar coming in at a negative 5.42 percent. A and D uh, below seventy dollars, holla, negative six point six nine percent, and then um, end phase is at negative six point eight seven percent. So that is what happened in the market. Um, we have Uncle Charles commenting that healthcare has been killing it. Okay. Yeah, you want to know who's also been killing it? There's actually a stock that we actually gave everybody that's been running this year. Uh, that's probably one of the best. I think it's probably the best one of the best performers in the pick list. And you actually just named it as the top number one. Did you know Jordan, oh, that yes. SQQQ mm -hmm. is up 80 percent year to date? Well, you know, Mark, every time what's interesting about SQQQ, it's um, I always see this little extra twinkle in your eye. Anytime <laughs> SQQQ is mentioned in the top, you're just like, yeah, yeah. So. I'm going to start wearing a mask now. You know what? I'm going to put on the Black Panther mask moving forward. You know, either that or I actually have to possibly pass it on to you know, Lawrence. But, Yo. hey, it is what it is. I mean, you got, like, you got SQQQ doing well this year. You also have Devin Energy doing well this year and a few other players. So, I mean, it's a little something, something for everybody. And then, of course, United Health. Yeah. They out here. Yeah. So, I mean, let's... Let's let's move on because like that's not the reason why we're here today. We are here to get into some technical analysis and also tie economics possibly into some of that technical analysis. So you know what? I'm let me get into my into my MC Master of Ceremonies mode. Here we go. You've seen him. <laughs> You've seen him bless the stage of many of the live streams via bar chart. Mm -hmm. You have also seen him bless the stage here on the come up series very recently. And like I said, back by popular demand because the man definitely keeps it real when it comes to the charts. He mm -hmm. definitely gives it no sugar coating, but always gives it with nothing but the truth. Absolutely to the truth and all teaching. Give it up for none other than cousin John Roland. Hey, bar chart. Welcome. <laughs> welcome back. Welcome thank back. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> this is Appreciate so exciting, it. John. We are here on the eve of your show coming out on Friday, and you're here with us. Thank I know. You. This is great. You know, <laughs> I don't normally do shows on Thursdays either, so we're in the same boat. <laughs> so we're all in this. We're all in this together. <laughs> yeah. Well, I definitely am feeling the. Um, it's feeling very weekend vibe-ish, you know, like. Yes. Even though we're at the end of the week, there's still so much um, to talk about. And, and certainly with the volatility of the market, you kind of, there's kind of this heaviness that weighs on you. You're like, oh, I'm so glad this week is over so the market can stop going down, right? <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. I'm probably sure that people definitely feel that way. All right. So where should we begin? So... Let's, I guess we should start from, because the last time you were here, I think we had just, like the market had, like was on its way to bottoming out June 14th. Um, so the S&P 500 hit, I think it was 36, 43 or something, or in some change. And then after that, we saw a significant rally back up, uh, I think probably about maybe to the 50% marker. And then after that, it's like, all right, Jackson Hole happened. And then that was just all. Whole set of a vibe alongside with we got some economic data indicators like for example cpi came out we consistently kept seeing the uh we, we kept seeing wages and jobs uh still remaining strong so there was a lot of data that was playing out and of course i think the shot heard around the world was definitely powell's speech which was all of eight minutes who would have thought that such power and such emphasis came through in eight minutes and come to find out, we heard that he was supposed to give a 30-minute speech, but he just said, you know what? Scrap this speech. I'm just going to just shoot straight from the heart. And uh, he didn't miss. 
um, no. at all. <laughs> he didn't miss at all. He was super and Mike. <laughs> and since then, we've I mean we've we've seen earnings you know pretty decent. Um, and now here we are after the shot heard around the world, and then of course yesterday we had Powell speak again, which was the Fed had raised for the third time this year, 75 basis points. So that kind of brings us into like the catch up since, you know, since we last saw you. So let's first, let, let's first take it from, let's look at some, because tonight is going to be all about charts. It's all about charts. So where do you think that we should begin tonight? Um, well, do you mind if I share? Of no, course. go for it. All right, so let me do that. For the first time in the Come Up Series history with Jolene and Mark, somebody else controls the screen. Like, look at this. You're about to see. We got it no working, hands. y'all. We got it working. No hands. Am, no am hands. I sharing? Do you see my bar chart? Yay. No hands, people. I yes, we it. do. All right, great. So I think what and I I I don't I don't want to overcomplicate um the message that I'm gonna kind of tell you is but I, I just want to kind of give this in a sense of where does money go or money seeks returns. And if we think about the, the S and P market, and this is kind of what you were talking about is, you know, we had mm -hmm. that nice bottom, we rallied up. Um, and I think the number that you were calling it the 50% return uh, off the bottom, but, what it really was is the 200 day moving average is kind of what we yep. bounced off of. And the other thing is now I've named this chart pattern, you know, this candlestick chart pattern. This is, I've called this now, we're going to put this in the history books. We're going to call this the Powell hammer, right? Let's do it. That's the hammer, right? You see that hammer? Mm -hmm. That was, that was the, the Jackson hole. And what did he say? He said that the fed is committed to continue to raise interest rates until they bring inflation under control. So, you know, as a, an average investor to say, like, why should I care what the Fed is doing? You know, I mean, okay, yeah, they raise interest rates, but what it, what is it? Why, why is the stock market going down? Because interest rates are going up. Now, there's a lot of variables, a lot of things we can talk about. But I think if we really boil it down to the essence, it comes down to this, that, you know, since the beginning of the year this mm -hmm. is a chart of the one year t bill yield that you know t bills have gone from literally zero percentage to four percent in what is it nine months or so i mean nine that's months. a huge movement in a very short period of time but what is that ramifications every time the fed raises rates and that's the only tool the Fed has, right? They don't have other tools. They can't go out in the shopping cart and say, hey, you can't buy that, right? They want to try to dampen demand, you know, or you can't go on a vacation or you can't spend money. No, the only way they, the only tool they have is to raise rates. They have the interest rate tool. That's their tool. So as they mm -hmm. raise interest rates, what happens is then folks who have monies that are sitting on the sidelines now have an alternative to the stock market. Now, let's kind of look at this in terms of a historical perspective. And, you know, we're talking about we have just broken, you know, this major downtrend that has been going on with interest rates for, what, some 20 years? A generation of traders yep. have only known falling interest rate markets. But not only that, but since the last, you know, the last 10 or 12 years, interest rates have relatively been at zero. Mm -hmm. So if you were looking for returns for your money, the only game in town was the stock market. And that is why we see had seen extraordinary gains in the stock market since 2009 to, you know, just 2020, where, you know, I think the market um, from the beginning of QE in 2009 is up almost 650%. So now what is happening is, there's another kid in town, right? There's another game in town. And that game is a one-year note. And it does not have to be one-year note. It's all treasuries, all uh, uh, interest rate-bearing securities. I can invest in a one-year note and re receive right today a 4% annual return, guaranteed, no risk. Risk-free. 
yeah. risk free. I can't say that about the stock market from a year from now, can I? No. No. Could stocks go back up? Yes. Could they go back up 5, 10, 20%? Surely. But at this moment in time, there's more risk in the stock market to the downside because now there's an alternative to investing besides stock. And so now where we would normally see dip buyers in the stock market because there's no alternative, now monies can say, hey, we can go and buy something that is risk-free. And that is why I think in the long run, uh, what we're seeing is the stock market is kind of reevaluating what is the value of stocks versus something, an alternative, in this case, a risk-free asset. So let's let's go back a little bit because, you know, one of the things that a lot of folks are saying, well, the Fed only has one tool in its toolbox, which is raising rates. Now, we know that in raising rates, it crushes demand, but it's not really the type, the type of demand that everybody thinks that it is. Like, for example, a lot of folks think that they're crushing consumer demand. No. John, what what demand do you what demand do you know that the Fed is crushing right now? There's only one demand, and that's credit demand, right? That's the only demand that they can crush. But that credit demand, as they lower that, right? As they make credit more expensive, that slows down economic activity, right? Consumers don't spend as much, right? Your credit cost cards cost more. Right. You make you make conscious decisions. Do I want to spend money if I'm going to use my credit card or do I want to spend money on essentials or do I want to spend money on a brand new iPhone? And that's how that ripple effect goes to the market as the cost of credit goes up. And now we're, that's at the consumer level. But let's think about it at the um, corporate level. Right. You know, yep. for decades, we've had what we call zombie companies, companies that had no earnings. Right. But they were able to sustain themselves because they could literally borrow money at zero interest rates. But now they're going to have to pay that bill. Now, not 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 only um, corporations, but this rate raise that we've seen in the one year note has added a trillion dollars to the federal deficit just on servicing debt. And right. for every one percentage point we go up. I think I read it costs us an extra three hundred billion dollars in debt services. So, who is really the Fed tightening the credit on? The largest credit demand borrower, which is the federal government. That is so correct. it really has a huge ripple effect to the market. Well, yeah. So go ahead. Go ahead, Jolyn. I was going to say, this is um, really interesting, just given how um, with the come up series coming on the scene in 2020 and the contrast between what things were like with all the liquidity in the market for options and how now that there is, you know, an, another option, <laughs> which is the T, the T bills and T notes and all that, like what, um, as far as where you know, these returns can go or can come from more than the 4%. I mean, I guess you can get SQQQ since it's up 80%, but where are these other, you know, what, what should cousins be thinking about um, as we're in this kind of, uh, as you described it, this reevaluation when it comes to equities? Well, unfortunately in bear markets and mm -hmm. bear markets that are, you know, where inflation is part of that, uh, uh, analysis, there's really no place to hide. Um, because even if you buy risk-free assets like a treasury note at 4%, you still have that inflationary aspect, right? If inflation is going up at 8% and you're in an asset that's only returning 4%, you're actually losing 4% on your money. So the, it, to answer the question, there's really no place to hide. So what we kind of kind of do is just do our best defense so looking for those assets that might not fall in value, but still will give us some type of return. So, I mean, obviously, like some dividend stocks would might be um, better. But again, let me share, you know, 
and I want to kind of give you this. I was going to say, let's look into that because let's because we just saw the rate of return at four percent for the one year note. So, how so, does that say, for example, cross reference to something else that would say, for example, be in the dividend side of, of the table? Right. So here is again. Uh, hopefully, yeah, I can see that you can see this. So this is the S and P dividend. This is the spider, the SDY. Now this is um, an ETF that is called inside of it, it contains what is called the aristocrats of dividends. These are, there's 124 companies in this ETF. These are companies that have consistently raised dividends every year for the last 20 years. So you're talking about a very exclusive. I mean, there's what 5,600 different equities out there. We're only, you know, 125 make it into this, into this basket. And you really can see this playing out, right? This prices have been falling, right? Even though these are very secure securities, you know, the dividend rate is uh, 2.7%. So again, if we think about this in terms of competition of return on value, if I was going to look for um, a 4% yield in an equity, and, and for instance, this ETF, this ETF would have to fall down below $100. I think I think the value is somewhere around $86. That's that revaluation and I'm, that I'm saying is that equities are still too expensive now that there's another alternative. Now, that is kind of a depressing scenario, right? But there still always are bull markets always in the mark, right? There's, no matter. One of the ones that you... Um, pointed out United Healthcare, um, UNH, right? I think that is, yeah, United Healthcare. Yep. Right? Um, you know, that one has definitely been an outperformer this year, right? Um, yep. Uh, was it UNH? Yeah, yes. UNH. Yep, UNH. Um, but again, let's see what the dividend on this one is paying, right? I mean, again, a very low annual dividend rate. But this is in one of those industries that we would think that even in a recessionary environment, they're going to still do well, right? People still need health insurance, right? They still have to pay for health insurance, you know, regardless of their status, right? One of the stocks that just made an all-time high is General Mills, right? Yeah. Now, again... Let's think about General Mills. You know, General Mills are consumer staples, basic, com, you know, basic goods, right? Cheerios, you know, corn, uh, corn flakes is Kellogg's, but, um, you know, peanut butter, right? I think they own Skippy. Um, so what we can start thinking about is we might be able to still find equities that are going up, but we kind of want to find those equities that can push that pricing power through to the end user, the consumer, and those industries or those consumer goods that are essential, right? Because now we have this competition because things are a lot more expensive. You know, for um, you know uh, technology or consumer discretionaries, those are the ones that are going to suffer. Or any a company whose earnings start to fall, or their sales start to fall. Um, those stocks are going to suffer. So we kind of want to find those companies that their earnings are stable or that, you know, they're going to, um, uh, you know, continue to see sales uh, stay strong. You know, energy stocks have done really well, uh, you know, throughout most of this year. Now, recently they've come down, but, you know, people need energy, right? And that's why utilities do well in this kind of environment because, People still need to turn on their electricity and utility companies pay a relatively good dividend yield, right? So that's kind of where we want to start thinking about. Now, eventually, we want to move away from those as the market bottoms and starts to rotate to the, you know, to the, the next, whatever the next phase is. And I think the question you're going to ask me is, well, when is that going to happen, right? You read my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I swear I wish I had a crystal ball. We don't have we don't have a crystal ball. No, um, we don't. but let's 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 rephrase the question though. So, like for example, we know that the Fed has raised rates now three times at seventy five basis points. 
I think the target is what 4.4, 4.6. Um, as it pertains to the to the I guess that brings us to I think neutral. Though that there is something that if we we kind of date back to the 70s, 80s under Volcker, um, there is a specific saying that goes as it pertains to the actual target of where is it that you know normally where you want to get to. What what would that what would that target be, John? Well, the theory that was put back by Chairman Volcker and Milton Friedman, another economist, is that in order to curb inflation, you need to bring the Fed's fund rate to at least the core CPI. And if we look at where the core CPI is now in the last <laughs> data that we got, what was it, 8.3%? 8, 8. 8. So that's a long way away, isn't it? <laughs> Very much so. No, but what could so, happen is what? Rates could rise inflation, and inflation, inflation comes could down. Come down and we could meet somewhere in the middle. But where mm -hmm. is going to be that equilibrium? I don't know. Five, I, I'm not showing here the one-year note. I just think that, it, to me, in a technical aspect, and if you look at where rates were you know, a generation ago, yep. you know, I remember going, you know, five percent six percent yield was kind of normal and that you know my first mortgage back in you know i'm, I'm gonna date myself 19 <laughs> uh my first mortgage was 16 percent. imagine people today Whoa. thinking about a mortgage that was 16 percent. and i remember when mortgage rates started to fall i refinanced at nine percent and i thought i was a hero you thought you were doing <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> Imagine that oh. on the way back up, right? Imagine that on the way back up. So I, I think, you know, we talk about, you know, our, where, uh, when will we get out of the woods? I think we're just walking into the woods now. I don't even think we're even close to getting out of the woods. You know, most recessionary cycles, they say, uh, you know, 12 months to 24 months, maybe 18 months. You know, if you think about this one started at the beginning of this year, so, yep. you know, maybe the second quarter of next year, maybe the third quarter of next year, you know, if we can bring inflation down, we stabilize the Fed fund rates, it doesn't rise anymore. Um, we revaluate the stock market. You know, I, I'm, I'm not predicting that the stock market is going to crash, but I'm just saying it could be a slow grind. You know, if I look at, you know, I'm a big believer is that, you know, falling markets is good for the markets. I think it's it's yes. creates value. And most bear markets, um, the peak of bear markets is, is the general rule is around 30 percent or 35 percent. And just a 35 percent pullback in the S&P puts us around 3200. Now, in the scale of the big picture, is that ugly no it's actually i would healthy 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 that's when we're going to look for opportunities uh in equities that's when we're going to look for growth stocks that's when we're going to look for you know as we come you know the economy starts to pick up but until then you know i think what we have to do is be very very selective in the stocks we pick because you can see that a stock could have a really good set of earnings and they give one little clue that hey maybe we see a little dark cloud on the horizon look what happened to ford this week right i mean everybody loved ford ford was the darling of all the industry right ev this that but ford sends out this little teeny little message well we're seeing some things on the horizon <laughs> what happened to ford stock of ford <laughs> right literally down 20 percent overnight so that's why we need to be very very selective you know and again julian as far as where do we hide Unfortunately, there's really no, there's no place, place to hide. hide. Yeah. So, so here's the question, like, because I think that's the question that, like, we're we're hearing in multiple different circles, right? Um, one, has the Fed gone too far, too fast? So, for example, he's gone very much so aggressive in 2022, but meanwhile, it's like, okay, where was this energy? Should he have started the rate hikes in 2021? When we started seeing some of the when we started seeing some of the results there, quantitative easing coming to its end and start quantitative tightening in 2021, and then essentially you know getting to a place where we're probably addressing of inflation at the close of 2021, which we would have possibly you know seen you know 
maybe some of those rate hikes take place at the, in late 2021 or early 2022. So the question is, now that we're here, because, of course, we can't go over the past because the past is the past. Right. And so now that we're here, is the Fed doing too much too fast? Like, is so what? do we see that? So are we trying to get to that rate too fast? And the question, I think the biggest question is, is that has the damage itself already been done? I think that that's the question that we want to we want to answer first. Before I think to it's twofold. Question. First is that I think the Fed, you know, again, this is my own personal opinion. I think the Fed was late to recognizing, right? They held on to this transitory thought for mm -hmm. too long. They were late to the game. So they've now they're behind the curve. They're chasing inflation, right? Right. Yep. There's the we still have this negative interest rate, right? Because inflation is running at eight percent and they're even you know, the, the short term rates are still, you know, way below that. So there's they're right. still behind the ball, they're still chasing it. Um but let's say and this is what really frustrates me when I see um, you know, the those talking heads on TV who say, Oh, the Fed's going to pivot or they're going to slow down, right? Or they might yeah. even lower rates in the beginning of next year. And and that, and what does that do? It creates this kind of euphoria around, you know, the average retail investor that says, Oh, maybe it's okay to go back in the market. And and, and I think they're doing folks a disservice mm. because what we have to understand is that if the Fed does pause, right? And let's say other central banks start raising their rates. But right. let's say the Fed does pause. It hasn't yet curved inflation. Now, could it, that happen? Could there be a deflationary effect that we have this lag? Yeah, that could. But what we saw in the 70s was the Fed back then did the same thing. And one of the things Paul Volcker said was that he had an opportunity to continue to raise rates, but he paused. And then what happened was inflation Dollar. came back, right? Because think about this. If the Fed stops raising rates and every time they raise the rates, then that makes the dollar denominated interest rates more desirable around the world and money flies into the dollar. The dollar becomes very, very strong. If the Fed pauses and other central banks raise their rates, which we're starting to see them trying to catch up with the Fed now, that makes the dollar less desirable, which is actually a good thing for us because it makes our goods cheaper around the world. Cheaper. But the falling dollar also takes away a headwind that has been keeping commodity prices down. So it's kind of like, you know, the genie in the bottle, right? And, Pick your you know, poison. <laughs> exactly, right? So has the Fed probably stepped on the brakes too hard? I, I would say probably, yeah. But because what has happened is, you know, they were driving flying down the road with quantitative easing. We we're doing 85 miles an hour, and all of a sudden the speed limit goes to 25. You know, you're in a school zone. Somebody's and, definitely getting a ticket. <laughs> yeah, so you're either going to run over somebody or you're going to get a ticket, right? So pick your poison. So I think the Feds is is going to sacrifice the economy in order to um, drive inflation down, which is you know. I mean, I, I hate saying this. That's bad, right? I mean, some of yeah. the folks that, that are watching you, I mean, they could, in theory, lose their jobs. Lose their jobs. Right? And so one of the things I tell, like, a lot of my friends now is, you make, make sure you have a, a, a game plan, right? You know, you have at least, you know, six months of savings that, you know, so you can find a new job or that, you know, as a, as a, you know, always have your resume ready. You know, I mean, the job market is still good. There's still jobs to be found out there. But, you know, I see every day in the news, you know, another company saying, hey, they're starting to look, looking to lay off. 10%, 20%. Right. And, and we're not talking about like small companies. I think I saw something like Facebook came out and said they're going to lay off 10%. Um, you know, a lot of these, um, uh, SPAC Technology companies are companies. definitely yeah, exactly. a lot of SPAC companies are definitely starting to lay off yeah. uh, for sure. Um, and then of course it's like, and it does. And, and the other part about it is, is that, you know, what I'm also seeing on my side is also like of the tech world is that not, if, if they're not 
if they're not cutting jobs, they're they're cutting headcount. So which means that essentially the folks that they would recruit for, they've scaled back on a lot of those recruits just to bring in OPEX spending and essentially say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna get a little bit more tighter in our budgets without having to cut people, but we cut the amount of folks in whom we that we bring into the company. So right. we are seeing that we are seeing that that come into the foray. But I would say that, you know, then at the same token, though, we saw companies do that earlier. And the, that's the question that I'm, you know, kind of like starting to ask myself is, you know, are we starting to see that, you know, because a lot of the tech companies, I saw them doing that earlier this year. They did that early before everybody else was like literally even discussing it. And now it's like, OK, hey, now that they did that earlier, do they will they have the early onset jump before everybody else does when they start recruiting? And one of the companies that I'm definitely keeping an eye on is, you know, Microsoft, uh, Apple, and Netflix as it pertains to recruitment. Because they were the first ones that I saw that really started to like literally kill, you know, headcount or, or literally shrink. And now I think that they're getting into this phase that now that they've done that, budgets are essentially being reset at the end of this month, which is pretty much next week. We'll probably start seeing those new headcount numbers start to literally solidify themselves probably in November. Right. So it's interesting in which that we're seeing. So I guess the next question is because we just went through X amount of data. Mm-hmm. So for the beginning, for the beginning, let's say the beginning investor. So we just talked about a lot of folks who are probably within the market. So let's talk about the beginning investor who's probably watching the show and is like, okay, I'm literally scared. <laughs> right. I'm literally scared to become an investor or I'm, in, or I'm even scared to become a trader. What, what do we, what do we tell them today? Because we, if, if we're not, if they're not getting the message that they should be seeing in say, for example, most of your media outlets, what is it that they should be? What is it that they should be hearing tonight? What's the truth? Yeah. Well, what's, I mean, let's get to the truth. I mean, it, if we believe in history, we believe in the American dream. We believe in America as an, you know, the America Inc. Over the long period, the stock market does tend to outperform. What I would say to the average investor is, unfortunately, what has happened for the last ten years is we've had this great experiment that has disrupted the market, and that there is a, this great rebalancing or re-equilibrium that needs to come to the market. But there still are opportunities out there. So what I would say is one of the my favorite – hang on, let me show it to you. <laughs> one of my favorite books is Peter, Peter Lynch. Lynch. And um, he basically beating had a philosophy. Beating, that's beating the street, right? Yeah, beating the street. His philosophy was trade what you know. In other words, invest in the companies that you believe in, that you use in your day-to-day life, right? Um, you know, the grocery stores that you go to, the, uh, the appliances that you use, you know. Um, you know, one of the great examples that I have is that in my family, we have a summer vacation house that was right down the street from a CVS that was, you know, has been in the family for you know generations. And as little kids, my grandma would give us a quarter and we'd go down to the CVS and buy, you know, remember those push-ups? You know, the the push-pops. Pop, push-pops, right? Remember those? <laughs> they were a quarter. That's how long ago this was. Um, but, you know, CVS has been part of my family, right? That's where we get all our drugs, our prescriptions. You know, if you need to get suntan lotion or, you know, you buy the, you know, your flip-flops. What I'm saying is, you know, I've always invested in CVS. Now, I'm at a point now that I have enough shares of CVS in my account, in my long-term account, that the dividend that CVS pays me is kind of like a frequent flyer card or a, a, a bonus shopper card. CVS is actually paying me to be their customer now. So in the long run, I, I would encourage folks not to worry about the dynamics of day-to-day happenings in the markets is start investing in companies or start looking at those companies that you believe in, that you use in your day-to-day life and, and, and nibble, you know, don't jump all in, start looking for, and wait for when you start seeing 
you know, trends change, right? Wait until you start seeing higher highs and higher lows, right? You know, don't try to catch a falling knife. One of the one of the worst uh, strategies I hear is, oh, I want to buy this stock because its price has fallen. In my world, it's fallen for a reason, right? Right. So let it fall. Let it, right? It's a lot easier to catch a falling knife after it hits the ground than it is to try to catch it as it's falling, right? Sure. So let it hit the ground and bounce and then look for buying opportunities. One of them, normally, you probably won't catch a falling knife even after it bounces. You're going to wait till it probably settles on the floor first. Well, exactly. Just for the kids out there that are watching. Yeah. <laughs> so Go I'm, ahead, I Dylan. mean, that's difficult advice to give at this point because where we are in this market, but there are markets that are doing doing well. I mean, I showed you that General Mills story, right? The, you yep. know, health tech, consumer staples have been do doing doing well. But I think when the economy starts to you know, stabilize, you can start thinking about you know materials and industrials. You know, you know there's kind of this cycle, a sick cycle of markets. And then as the economy starts getting stronger, then we can start thinking about growth stocks. We can go back into, like you said, your your Apples and your Microsofts and, and companies like that, right? Yeah. Go ahead, Jolyn. You had a question? Say, um, no more of a comment. I was going to say, like, zooming out when we're looking at, um, like, inflation and um, potential, you know, job loss or what have you, um, it's really driving the point home that our dollars really do have to, we have to maximize them. And so like, if you're spending money, you better be getting something extra. Like now I'm to the point now where I don't spend a dollar unless I'm getting um, something, something back, whether that's miles, whether that's, you know, percentage, <laughs> cash back. something, I'm getting something back. And I've been doing that um, for a while now just as part of my own strategy, especially in like this market, especially when SMH, you know, is, which is my stock bay is not, you know, acting the way that I would want it to act right now. You know, they have, they have a, they have a love long-term love relationship with each other. <laughs> John, that's a whole other story offline that we can talk about, but I say that all to say that there is some, there's something to be said about loyalty and I'm not saying loyalty, um, to the markets necessarily, but loyalty to your our own personal values and um, making sure that that trickles down into our own perspective. So putting ourselves first um, in the sense that, okay, if the markets are acting one way and we're not seeing actual returns, okay, we'll like double up on investing in ourselves. or investing Exactly, in yes, I love that. And one another. Um, you know, I, I just have to shout out Delta right quick because Delta stays on the, just showing the love. I have not paid for a first class flight in, I don't know, maybe two years. Woo -woo. And every time <laughs> automatic upgrade, they're like, Oh, Miss GC, you're here. Okay. Here, here you go. And it's because of that loyalty and maximizing those dollars. Like not one dollar gets spent unless I know. Right. A utilitarian effect, right? You want to make sure yes. that that dollar is giving you that max utilitarian effect, right? So I agree with you 100%. But what are the other things that we can invest in on ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Education, right? right. Uh, investing, you know, fixing up our homes, and, you know, um, making sure that the car that we own is well maintained and and maintenance right and, and not letting you know things go bad you know making sure our health you know um you relationships know. like relationships that, you know, yeah right networking I'm, right i'm bringing that up right now because my um nephew is here and he has i don't know if you guys can hear him but he has literally tried to break in because he knows i'm in here and he likes to play with that tesla in the background and um, <laughs> he's got good taste Yesterday, I think for like an hour, we just spent time and I never do this. I'm not the auntie that, you know, will just sit down and play with you. But um, <laughs> we played for hours and hours just, you know, with his little toys and the joy on his face. 
you know, if I if the market was doing well, I would probably be glued to the screen doing all kinds of stuff, you know, and not and I would be missing those moments. So, again, you know, we get to expand ourselves beyond just what's happening in the market. It is so important mm-hmm. to also live life and life really can be lived like what I'm living life right now. Like, I'm, you know stay in the on my technicals and stuff because I'm learning and I'm happy that your show tomorrow um, by the way <laughs> you know and I you know did you want to say a little bit about that Was I do like- thank you for asking me segue um, segue <laughs> um but you know Julian Julian let me tell you a, a little bit of a you know I love talking telling stories um as I pull this up so yeah, um, one of the things that I remember was an old trader who was like dressing like a lot of young traders who would come to the market every day and and would never miss a day, and never take a day off, or never be with their families or go on vacation. They just came to work every day because it was all about money, all about money. They needed to be there, and they were afraid they were going to miss out on something. And he said this line, and I, it really, I re- it really resonated with. Him. He was like, he's like, you know, you, you you have to cherish your family, you have to cherish the time you have on this earth, and that the casino will always be here. It's always open, right? Mm-hmm. And it, right, it's always open. So don't worry, you're not going to miss out on anything, right? You know, there will always be opportunities. There's always a bull market somewhere, right? It's more important to be like you said take care of yourself and if you take care of yourselves then your process your trade plan your mental capacity will help you become a better trader so i think that's a great learning lesson so yeah so on fridays we have something called a new show we have called market on close now this is only for premier members of uh, bar chart but again you know you talk about investing in yourself uh, um the cost on a per month basis is about four trips to starbucks so you want to talk about getting value for your dollar <laughs> stop going to starbucks and paying five dollars for a cup of coffee and and <laughs> buy a bar chart premium membership and get into these uh these sessions that we have where we're going to talk about you know a lot of the stuff that we talked about today my segment for Friday is a show what I'm going to call it. Hey, have you guys ever watched or listened to those um, uh, small town murders? You know, those, those podcasts. I don't know if you guys. So uh, I used do... to listen to the adventures of Harry Nile. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to do like a podcast tomorrow, which is going to be called the death of Tina. Oh, wow. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Dun. <laughs> and Tina stands for there is no alternative. And that was kind of the hinting what I was showing you uh, with the ten-year, excuse me, the one-year note, is that for so long we didn't have an alternative, and now there is an alternative to the markets, and that is kind of the discussion that we we started lead it off with today. So we're going to kind of take that to another level. So, you know, I you know I encourage folks to you don't even need to be a premium member to use bar chart. We have a lot of great features. All my Wednesday webinars. Um, are free to users and you can find that on our learn page uh, under archive webinars but we also have a youtube channel where you can go and watch these as well so i would encourage you to folks to do that as, as and we'll, we'll link that in the description down below so don't worry about that we got you covered cool awesome i appreciate that um but let me Did just have a question you... for you by yeah, the way go ahead. after we finish after no i'll have i have a question for you after you go through this I'm pretty much done. Oh, okay. So <laughs> anyway, I, did, I did want to show you one more yeah. chart. Yeah, go ahead. And, go ahead. And um, the chart that I was kind of going to show you is, and this kind of brings that discussion about inflation back, right? So this is the commodity index fund. Oh, there's there's a lot of perfect. them out there. Um, there it is. Did you see it? What? Yeah, no, no, I was saying like you were pretty much headed, we were in the same mindset. Go for it. Oh, okay, cool. So here's this discussion, right? We're saying, oh, peak inflation, right? And if we look at the commodity index fund here, 
yeah, commodity prices have come down from the peak of June. And that's, you know, that's this kind of this narrative that everybody said, oh, yeah, the, the Fed's working. It's like magic. It's working. It's it's affecting the market. It's affecting these these commodities, right? And the commodity prices are falling down. But now we're kind of at this, you know, this base level. But everything's relative, isn't it, Mark? Right? Mm-hmm. Everything's mm-hmm. relative. And if we look at this in terms of relative, yeah, prices have come down. But in relative terms, inflation really. is still here, right? Mm-hmm still here so we got a lot of work to do right is that yeah. what you were going to go with brother i was and the the next part that i was it, it kind of plays into it since you stepped into the commodities arena one of the things that you know a lot of things that we saw that energy has come down but the thing that we're kind of like and and i'm kind of like thinking like we asked i asked you this question before we went live where i was talking about well i wonder if the fed kind of has this in their back pocket in the back of their mind as they may see other areas of inflation maybe coming down and dropping you know we saw energy come down but then the question is we still have a winter coming and you know what does that look like as it pertains to you know when we think about energy oil um going into the winter and you know especially when we think about the production of what the u.s is having to do especially having to supplement for other arenas, you know, what does that cost look like for Americans versus folks overseas? And so how does that play into the inflation uh, discussion? That, that's a great um, uh, question. And yeah, the, you know, you have to think about uh, when we talk about energy prices, yeah, energy prices have come down. Let's say when we talk about gasoline, right? It's, if gasoline has fallen, I think it was 99 days in a row, like it was one day from 100 days. Mm-hmm. But we got down to a level where, again, you know, think about the gas pump around your house. I know, you know, six weeks ago it was 450 around me. Now it's down around 320. So what does that do? That creates demand, doesn't it? Right. Because now it's I'm nice. like, you know, before I was like, you know, if I had to go out, to run my errands, I'd make sure that I had it all lined up, so I'd limit an amount of mileage. But now I'm like, hey, you know what? Let's go go apple picking and drive an hour away or whatever. Because price, you know, instead of paying a hundred dollars to fill my tank, I'm only spending, you know, re- relatively less 40, amount, but we're still 50. spending that money. But the balance in the energy market is a very very thin line here between production and um, demand. And yes, the crude oil prices have come down, but there's other energy costs. And the one that you know I want to kind of show you here is um, natural gas. And again, yeah, have prices kind of fallen in recent weeks? Yeah, they have after peaking out at ten dollars. But everything's relative, right? I mean, look at where natural gas prices were just two years ago. You know, mm-hmm. below three dollars. So. Again, I think when we move into the winter, there's going to be this sticker shock that is going to hit the average consumer is that their energy bills, especially if you're in an area where you use natural gas to heat your home, you might see your natural gas bill triple this year. And that is another ripple effect that is going to run through the market because if people are spending more money on uh, utility costs, Again, less money to spend on luxury goods or discretionary goods or travel or or all those other things. So my concern is that you know natural gas prices are too high. Now, why are natural gas so prices high? We're not in the winter. Well, that's because a lot of the natural gas that we produce here in the United States is turned into what is called LNG, liquefied natural gas. It's put mm-hmm. on these giant ships and it's sent to other countries. And the, the main countries that it's being sent to right now is Europe. So we're really subsidizing Europe's energy consumption through our domestic production. And so my question at a political level, right, at a grassroots level, how are Americans going to feel when they realize that this natural precious resource that is ours is being captured and sold to a foreign nationals? 
especially foreign nationals that maybe aren't our allies or maybe our our foes you know in asia or you know into china right so right. um that is a question that i can't answer but as a regular american i was like you know maybe we should take care of ourselves first before we start worrying about what's happening around the world i know that's kind of a selfish attitude but look what we have to deal with it right we're Correct. trying to be generous and kind and and be do the right thing but we're literally slicing our own throats right so i don't know i mean that's never been america's way though we stay in everybody's business um <laughs> and i didn't want to make it political but yeah, yeah. what's that for the whole we're the, we're the hall monitors of the world. Right, the police of the world. <laughs> the hall right? pass. <laughs> yeah. So Well, J John, thank you so much for like literally just gracing the stage and you know this is definitely setting up a part 3. <laughs> I have a feeling that this is going to have multiple multiple chapters along the way. But, you know, honestly, it's like it's it's always interesting when we come together and we have these discussions. And also, it's like when we come back later for the next one, you know, just seeing exactly where what has the market done, what has transpired in between time. Um, it's always amazing. So we definitely want to get you back on the show again. Maybe we can do this every quarter. <laughs> so like now it's like every time that John comes on the show, it's like it's like our it's our our, our uh, quarterly earnings period. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, which is in the, which is the final thing? What do you what are your thoughts about uh, Q three earnings as we move into Q three uh, reports? Uh, I I think you're going to start seeing those companies that had um that had struggled right before COVID. There was a lot of companies that were struggling, and then you know the quantitative easing helped keep them alive. So those companies, I think, will continue to struggle. I'm worried about uh, companies that now have to uh, um, take in consideration of those sticky parts of inflation, right? Wage inflation, right? Um, you know, we have this rail potential rail strike. So transportation companies, you know, they, they're getting whacked on two sides. They got the energy costs, right? And now they're going to have wage inflation. So I'm really concerned about earnings moving forward, you know, across the board in terms of companies. If I see a company that I believe can pass through, um, you know, these inflation, sticky inflation parts to the their consumers, um, those are the companies that I'm going to kind of kind of watch for, you know, ones that I'm looking for, Just, you know, may, you know, maybe some, I think energy stocks, you know, between now and the end of the year are going to continue to perform well, even though energy prices have come down. I think they'll, 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 they'll do well. Right. So those are kind of, kind of, kind of companies I'm looking at. Okay. All right. Well, John, thank you so much for being on the show with us. Jolyn, it's very rare to see the comic series on a Thursday. <laughs> and to also have a, and also John to be up on, on a Thursday. So this is something that's like, you know, kind of abnormal for all of us, but we hope each and every single one of you at home definitely took some good notes, uh, have received some insight and perspective. Um, also, speaking of perspective, John did a show with uh, Jim also from Bar Chart, um, which was amazing, where it was giving you like differences of opinion. I'm not going to go through and tell you what, what transpired. I challenge each and every single one of you to go check it out for yourselves because it's definitely on the Bar Chart YouTube channel. Um, and also make sure you see him tomorrow on Friday. Uh, I think it's like 45 minutes before the market closes. It's a half an hour before, and then we have a 15 minute Q and a afterwards. Yeah. Nice. So definitely make sure you tap into that because there's a lot of significant value. And on top of that, you can get in, you can get knowledge while the market is still open. We don't do that here at the come up series quite yet. So, you know, you've got John for that and he's a one in our book. Um, John, we appreciate you so much for just taking the time out. Y'all for that came and joined us for this Thursday evening, uh, be sure to share this with someone that you may know or within your groups, within your family. Make sure that they get this information because it's solid, good knowledge. Keep learning, keep researching, because the more you learn, the more you earn. And uh, Jalen, you know, are we ready to go up? Are we ready to leave? 
Yeah. Is it know. cocktail time? <laughs> it's dinner time. For you. It's dinner time. It's yeah. definitely dinner time. So until next time, I am Mark Monroe, accompanied by our guest. John Rowland. AKA the oil, the oil cousin. <laughs> and you know, you know, it's me, Jillian G C ready to eat. <laughs> <laughs> and this has been a come up. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We'll see you guys next Tuesday, which we also have a special guest next Tuesday. But be sure to check out John's show tomorrow. Peace, y'all. <laughs>